Chapter 18 Monday morning, Joe groaned over the first truckload of clothes to the washer. I say, he began, don't talk to me, Martin snarled. I'm sorry, Joe, he said at noon, when they knocked off for dinner. Tears came into the other's eyes. That's all right, old man, he said. We're in hell, and we can't help ourselves. And, you know, I kind of like you a whole lot. That's what made it hurt. I cottoned to you from the first. Martin shook his hand. Let's quit, Joe suggested. Let's chuck it, and go hoboin'. I ain't never tried it, but it must be dead easy, and nothing to do. Just think of it, nothing to do. I was sick once, typhoid in the hospital, and it was beautiful. I wish I'd get sick again. The week dragged on. The hotel was full, and extra fancy starch poured in upon them. They performed prodigies of valor. They fought late each night under the electric lights, bolted their meals, and even got in a half-hour's work before breakfast. Martin no longer took his cold baths. Every moment was drive, 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 and Joe was the masterful shepherd of moments, herding them carefully, never losing one, counting them over like a miser counting gold, working on in a frenzy, toil-mad, a feverish machine, aided ably by that other machine that thought of itself as once having been one Martin Eden, a man. But it was only at rare moments that Martin was able to think. The house of thought was closed, its windows boarded up, and he was its shadowy caretaker. He was a shadow. Joe was right. They were both shadows, and this was the unending limbo of toil. Or was it a dream? Sometimes, in the steaming, sizzling heat, as he swung the heavy irons back and forth over the white garments, it came to him that it was a dream. In a short while, or maybe after a thousand years or so, he would awake, in his little room with the ink-stained table, and take up writing where he had left off the day before. Or maybe that was a dream, too. And the awakening would be the changing of the watches, when he would drop down out of his bunk in the lurching forecastle and go up on deck under the tropic stars, and take the wheel and feel the cool trade wind blowing through his flesh. Came Saturday, and its hollow victory at three o'clock. Guess I'll go down and get a glass of beer, Joe said, in the queer monotonous tones that marked his weekend collapse. Martin seemed suddenly to wake up. He opened the kit bag and oiled his wheel, putting graphite on the chain and adjusting the bearings. Joe was halfway down to the saloon when Martin passed by, bending low over the handlebars, his legs driving the ninety-six gear with rhythmic strength, his face set for seventy miles of road and grayed in dust. He slept in Oakland that night, and on Sunday covered the seventy miles back, and on Monday morning, weary, he began the new week's work but he had kept sober. A fifth week passed, and a sixth, during which he lived and toiled as a machine. With just a spark of something more in him, just a glimmering bit of soul that compelled him, at each weekend, to scorch off the hundred and forty miles. But this was not rest. It was super-machine-like, and it helped to crush out the glimmering bit of soul that was all that was left him from his former life. At the end of the seventh week, without intending it, too weak to resist, he drifted down to the village with Joe, and drowned life and found life until Monday morning. Again, at the weekends, he ground out the one hundred and forty miles, obliterating the numbness of too great exertion by the numbness of still greater exertion. At the end of three months, he went down a third time to the village with Joe. He forgot, and lived again, and, living, he saw, in clear illumination, the beast he was making of himself, not by the drink, but by the work. The drink was an effect, not a cause. It followed inevitably upon the work, as the night follows upon the day. Not by becoming a toil-beast could he win to the heights, was the message the whiskey whispered to him, and he nodded approbation. The whiskey was wise, it told secrets on itself. He called for paper and pencil, and for drinks all around, and while they drank his very good health, 
He clung to the bar and scribbled. A telegram, Joe, he said. Read it. Joe read it with a drunken quizzical leer, but what he read seemed to sober him. He looked at the other reproachfully, tears oozing into his eyes and down his cheeks. "'You ain't going back on me, Mart?' he queried hopelessly. Martin nodded, and called one of the loungers to him to take the message to the telegraph office. "'Hold on,' Joe muttered thickly. "'Let me think.' He held on to the bar his legs wobbling under him, Martin's arm around him and supporting him while he thought. "'Make that two laundrymen,' he said abruptly. "'Here, let me fix it.' "'What are you quitting for?' Martin demanded. "'Same reason as you. But I'm going to see. You can't do that.' "'Nope,' was the answer. "'But I can hobo all right, all right.' Martin looked at him searchingly for a moment, then cried. "'By God, I think you're right.' Better a hobo than a beast of toil. Why, man, you'll live, and that's more than you ever did before. I was in hospital once, Joe corrected. It was beautiful. Typhoid, did I tell you? While Martin changed the telegram to two laundrymen, Joe went on. I never wanted to drink when I was in hospital. Funny, ain't it? But when I've been working like a slave all week, I got to bowl up. Ever notice that cooks drink like hell, and bakers too? It's the work. They've sure got to. Here, let me pay half of that telegram. I'll shake you for it, Martin offered. Come on, everybody drink, Joe called, as they rattled the dice and rolled them out on the damp bar. Monday morning Joe was wild with anticipation. He did not mind his aching head, nor did he take interest in his work. Whole herds of moments stole away and were lost while their careless shepherd gazed out of the window at the sunshine in the trees. "'Just look at it,' he cried, "'and it's all mine. It's free. I can lie down under them trees and sleep for a thousand years if I want to. Ah, oh, come on, Mart, let's chuck it. What's the good of waiting another moment? That's the land of nothing to do out there, and I got a ticket for it, and it ain't no return ticket, by gosh.' A few minutes later, filling the truck with soiled clothes for the washer, Joe spied the hotel manager's shirt. He knew its mark, and with a sudden glorious consciousness of freedom, he threw it on the floor and stamped on it. "'I wish you was in it, you pig-headed Dutchman,' he shouted. "'In it and right there where I've got you. Take that and that and that, damn you. Hold me back, somebody. Hold me back.' Martin laughed and held him to his work. On Tuesday night, the new laundrymen arrived, and the rest of the week was spent breaking them into the routine. Joe sat around and explained his system, but he did no more work. Not a tap, he announced. Not a tap. They can fire me if they want to, but if they do, I'll quit. No more work in mine, thank you kindly. Me for the freight cars and the shade under the trees. Go to it, you slaves. That's right. Slave and sweat. Slave and sweat. And when you're dead, you'll rot the same as me. And what's it matter how you live, eh? Tell me that. What's it matter in the long run? On Saturday, they drew their pay and came to the parting of the ways. They ain't no use in me asking you to change your mind and hit the road with me? Joe asked hopelessly. Martin shook his head. He was standing by his wheel, ready to start. They shook hands, and Joe held on to his for a moment, as he said, I'm going to see you again, Mart, before you and me die. That's straight dope. I feel it in my bones. Goodbye, Mart, and be good. I like you like hell, you know. He stood, a forlorn figure, in the middle of the road, watching until Martin turned a bend and was gone from sight. He's a good Indian, that boy, he muttered, a good Indian. Then he plodded down the road himself, to the water tank, where half a dozen empties lay on a side track, waiting for the up freight. End of chapter 18